Thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, this program is being sponsored by the Allen Public Library and the Daughters of the American Revolution, the Bernardo Galvez chapter. They have graciously provided treats after the program. And um, also, this is being co-sponsored by VFW 2195. So, uh, We've got three organizations helping make this event possible. I want to introduce a few people. And uh, first of all, uh, we have three city councilmen here tonight. Would y'all stand? <laughs> then uh, I wanted to mention that out in the foyer after we after the DAR has their treats, stop by and look at this book. It's inside the display case. It's the Collin County soldiers and some ladies who served during World War II, and it has pictures of some of them who didn't make it home and, and many who did. Many, we lost, Collin County lost a number of people both in World War I, World War II, Korea, and uh, Vietnam. <coughs> and there's two people here tonight that have done more than anybody to preserve their heritage and legacy. And that is Colin Kimball and R.D. Foster. Would y'all stand? Uh, in some rare cases, um, we don't have photographs of the fallen heroes, and, and in some cases, heroines. And Colin has put together, I mean, some, some portraits of those folks that almost, and then after he did the portrait, we found photos, and the, the portrait he did looked like the photo. So he just has this amazing gift to uh, colorize and really bring to life uh, these people. And they're up on display at, at the Colin County Courthouse, is that correct? And uh, a number of those folks were from here in Allen. The, um, would y'all join me and uh, as we post the colors?
I had a request from Sergeant Clinton Warren, who's retired from the Army, and he represents the Texas Buffalo Soldiers Association. And he asked me if I would consider doing the Buffalo Soldiers roll call, and we'll hear it uh, in uh, the audio portion. And then after that, Councilman uh, Dave Cornett will introduce our speaker. And I'll have to say, when I first met our speaker, his title was Retired Lieutenant Colonel Keith Self, and then later, it be, when he became County Judge, I had to call him Your Honor, and then as of yesterday, I'll be calling him Congressman from the 3rd District, Congressman Keith Self. Private Murphy. Here, Sergeant Major. Private Smith. Here, Sergeant Corporal Baltimore. Corporal Baltimore. Corporal Charles Baltimore. Thank you, and thanks for coming out to dinner tonight. What a great looking crowd. Um, that, what we just heard, was very moving. I've participated in a ceremony like that once before down in Fort Hood, uh, not an easy thing. I wanna start off with uh, two things. First of all, I'm giving you homework. <laughs> you didn't think you were come out here and get homework today, did you? Well, you are. I want you to go home and research the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month. That's when the armistice for World War I was signed. And I'm gonna to touch on that a little bit here about uh, the buddy Poppy. I'm in the VFW and we were out there today and we do our buddy poppy drive and what we do is we raise funds for our relief fund for veterans in need. So that's what I figured I'd give you a little background on the buddy poppy. The poppy is a symbol of remembrance and hope, enduring hope for positive future and peaceful world. I'm sorry, I can't see that far down. They are a show of support for the armed forces community those currently serving and ex-serving personnel and their families, and a symbol of remembrance for all those who have fallen in conflict. A lot of times people, when we're passing on the Buddy Poppy's Day, don't understand the meaning or the symbol of that, so I figured I'd share that with you. I wanna share this next one with you real quick, uh, In Flanders Field. It is a poem that was written during World War I. Uh, it, and in that field, we had the, the, the poppies, and that's why we have the symbol of the buddy poppy at the VFW. So in Flanders Field is a poem, war poem, written in the form of Rondeau. I probably said that wrong, but it's medieval French. Written during the First World War by Canadian physicist, uh, physician, Lieutenant Colonel John McCree. He was inspired to write it on May 3rd of 1915 after presiding over the funeral of a friend and fellow soldier. Now I just want to read the poem to you. Um, as you get the background, I, it's kind of touching. In Flanders Field, the poppies below, between the crosses, row on row, that mark our place and in the sky, the larks still bravely sing and fly. Scarce heard amid the guns below, we are the dead short days ago. We lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders Field. Take upon our curl with the foe, to you from falling hands we throw. The torch be used, yours to hold it high, if ye break faith with us who die. We shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders Field. All right, got through that. It's just a little background in history of the Buddy Poppy and why we do what we do and the meaning of it. Um, but without further ado, our, our guest speaker tonight is uh, U.S. Congressman-elect Keith Self. Mr. Keith Self is a fifth-generation Texan. Texan. Keith graduated from the United States Military Academy at West Point and served on active duty for 25 years as an infantry officer. First retiring in 1999, he was recalled in 2002-2003 for service in Afghanistan and Qatar, serving on General Tommy Franks' staff during the invasion of Iraq. A ranger, Green Beret, and Master Parachutist, 
he served in the 82nd Airborne Division, the Green Berets, and multiple joint assignments. He is a graduate of the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College and holds a master's degree in international relations. Keith retired from the Army with the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. After retiring from the Army, Keith was elected Collin County Judge in 2006 and served three consecutive terms. It is my pleasure to introduce U.S. Congressman-elect of the great state of Texas, Keith Self. Well, I think that jazz band could be my warm-up act any night. And I'm surprised some of you didn't get up in the aisles and go dancing. As I thought about tonight, I, uh, I was introducing John Wayne Walding uh, last night. If you know John Wayne's uh, story, uh, in the Shock Valley in Afghanistan, uh, 12 Green Berets and a number of uh, Afghanis went up a mountain to find a high value target. Uh, seven hours later, after the battle, uh, which included numerous 500 pound bombs and one 2,000 pound bomb to try to get these guys down, uh, there were two medals of honor and eight silver stars in that one battle. And I said, that's not what I want to do tonight. So I went to my bookshelf and I pulled down a book uh, written by Dwight Eisenhower um, entitled Stories I Tell My Friends. And uh, I looked through it and it again, and it is literally that. It is uh, stories that Dwight David Eisenhower experienced in his military career. And I said, I think that's, uh, that's what I want to do. And I realized how nostalgic I'm, I'm getting now that uh, it's been 20 years since I last uh, donned my uniform, and uh, so I want to uh, just uh, just share some things with you, and I will tell you, Tom, thank you so much for doing this again. This is what, my third time to participate in this, I think, and at least, okay, and it's, it's always great. Uh, you always put together a great performance. Oh, we're going to do some questions, <laughs> so stick around. <laughs> um, my 25 years, I got to thinking about it, it encompassed 11 years of tactical time and exactly 11 years of time in the joint world, and I'll get into that. Uh, the rest of my 25 years of various schools and, and uh, travel and things like that. But first, a short review of the time period that I served in. Uh, I graduated from West Point on July the 4th, 1975. That was just two months after Saigon fell for the final time. We had withdrawn in 73, and it fell in April of 1975. Uh, I was a second lieutenant in an army, and I want to be careful here because I know that we've got Vietnam veterans here. I know we've got at least one ranger. Uh, Larry Green wears a star on his combat uh, infantryman's badge, and I'm sure we've got other men and perhaps women in this audience that uh, did heroic service in Vietnam. So I'm going to talk about the Ar Army in general, but I want to be careful because this is not everyone, because we had some great soldiers in Vietnam. But the Army that I joined in 1975 was uh, floundering in, in many respects. Um, we had won the battle on the battlefield. They admitted that afterwards, but we lost it in Paris. Uh, we lost it on the home front. Uh, the one man that was never elected president uh, was in office. He handed me my diploma, um, Gerald Ford. And two years later, uh, we had uh, Jimmy Carter. Uh, the services were underfunded uh, to the max. They were demoralized in the extreme. Uh, drugs were rampant, black and white uh, violence was, uh, was on the rise, ill discipline reigned. Uh, the first time that I had staff duty officer in the 82nd Airborne Division, uh, a good friend of mine still today uh, told me, he said, you will bust somebody for drugs tonight. And I said, how do you know I'm going to bust somebody for drugs tonight? And he said, trust me. So he told me how to handle it, and, and sure enough, I busted somebody for drugs that night. Um, by 1974, the Army was 20,000 short, 
And in 1973, Harris Poll revealed that the public ranked the Army only above sanitation workers in order of respect. Now, that's nothing against sanitation workers. Uh, but we, uh, we, it, we, there were not good days in the Army. Now, I want you to contrast that period with 1991 when we went to Desert Storm and the destruction in 100 hours of the complete Iraqi army, just 16 years later, 16 years later. So I came in at the, at the nadir of the, of the army in 1975. 16 years later, we were winning tank battles in seven seconds. Now that's not individual tank engagements, that, tank, that is tank battles in seven seconds. How did we go from a jungle war to excellence in a mid-intensity war between two forces equipped with modern heavy weapons, including the new stars of that war, which are the GPS, which guided uh, our forces across trackless deserts, you remember the big swing, and missiles, guided missiles, that could kill a tank at the at then incredible distance of 3,000 meters. Uh, today, we now have sniper shots that have uh, carried almost two miles, but at that time, 3,000 meters was, uh, was, was good range, tremendous range. Well, what showed us we needed to change was the 1973 Arab-Israeli War, uh, the fourth of their wars, and it happened just after we had pulled out of Vietnam in uh, 1973. It showed us we had to reform uh, to be able to handle a mid-intensity modern war. Uh, generals like uh, Abrams and Depew, or Depuy, however you want to pronounce it, I've heard both, uh, set out to reform and modernize the Army, uh, as did flag, flag officers in other services. The shortages during the, uh, during the Carter years. I earned my jump pay one month by jumping off the back of a moving deuce and a half because the Air Force did not have gas to fly their planes. We walked to the rifle ranges uh, because the Army didn't have gas for their transport trucks. There were shortages of everything during the Carter years. Um, I, I have to tell you, my second tour with the 82nd just uh, a few years later was totally different under Reagan, totally different. Uh, we trained to a standard and we were ready to, uh, to, to go. The modernization took hold gradually over those years. The development of four that I will mention, the Black Hawk helicopter, the Abrams main battle tank, the Bradley fighting vehicle, and the Apache attack helicopter, uh, uh, and the Patriot missile, uh, were known as the Big Five. Those were the ones that led the modernization and led the Army into the modern world. So then funding, development, training, doctrine, policy, all came together in 1991 for the overwhelming victory in Desert Storm. Uh, with that background, I started in the 82nd, infantry platoon leader, later a mortar platoon leader. I had a platoon sergeant that told me uh, very early in my uh, tenure as a platoon uh, leader, uh, before you go into combat, don't change nothing but your socks. Training and precedent is everything, because when that adrenaline rush hits you, uh, all you have is your training. All you have is the muscle memory of what you're going to do. Um, we trained uh, the, through reaction drills, through adrenaline. We were the division ready force. We were the I, uh, IRC, the infantry, the infantry ready company. Uh, and then I went to special forces training where I, uh, and after training and earning my Green Beret, I de deployed to the uh, forward deployed battalion in Germany. Uh, in Bad Tolz, it was a really tough assignment. We were stationed at the very foothills of the Alps, uh, south of Munich. Um, we did mountain marches in the summer, 50 miles up and down the mountains. It was great. We did ski marches in the wintertime up and down the mountains. It was great. Uh, there was a lot of fun. Um, there were a couple of missions that I was very disappointed I didn't get to go on. One was the soil sample uh, mission for... Uh, Desert One, you may remember we had uh, hostages in Iran in the, in the embassy. Uh, my team was actually on alert to go if President Carter had pulled the trigger fast because we had just gotten out of a live fire hostage rescue uh, training 
uh, session. And while we knew they were in one room, we probably could have had some success. Uh, but Carter couldn't, couldn't pull the trigger. So then we went to Desert War, uh, One uh, months later. My first sergeant later was on the C-130 that was next to the burning, uh, the burning helicopter. And First Sergeant Fontana told me that um, you American public were not told the truth about that mission. If you remember, President Carter told us that it was gonna be a bloodless extraction. We were gonna get in and out. We were gonna find the hostages and we we're gonna bring them out. And he told me, he said, sir, I had a rucksack, the biggest rucksack they had. I had nothing in it. I had a machine gun in my hands. I had nothing in it besides three spare barrels, a little bit of chocolate, a little bit of water, and all the ammo I could physically carry. My mission was to stand on this street corner and keep every Iraqi citizen out of that stadium, man, woman, child. If we got to the stadium, my mission was to make sure nobody got inside it. Um, obviously, we never made it that far. Uh, Desert One was a disaster. And one of the reasons that uh, that Army changed after that. But during, uh, during that time, uh, we had... Um, we had competitions with the local German uh, mountain unit. Uh, they were cream of the crop in the, in the German army. And I went down to one of those competitions thinking that I was gonna win uh, the rifle competition, right? So I showed up there thinking I was uh, really hot. And it wasn't the German army, it was the German Jägermeisters. And they showed up with these $20,000 rifles that they had, and they could drive a nail with them. And, uh, but I did win the pistol uh, competition because those same Jägermeisters couldn't, couldn't handle a pistol worth anything. Uh, and I've got that, uh, I've got that uh, mug somewhere uh, in, in a closet somewhere. I have to tell you though, we also uh, got the opportunity during those days, the Army built a new nuclear storage facility near Permisens, Germany. And they put everything they could think of on, it was a test facility, so it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a, a, a ready facility. They had radar, they had everything you could think of, infrared, everything that you could think of. And my team, because we were a nuclear team, and I'll get to that because we had all the nuclear uh, uh, clearances, uh, we were sent down there to do nothing for two weeks but try to bre breach that new test facility. Uh, and I will admit, I got as far as anyone in under the wire. I managed to tunnel under the wire and got in as far as anyone got before we got caught. Uh, but kind of made us mad so that we couldn't breach it without getting caught. So the no last night we called in the Halo team and, and they jumped in and we, uh, we took it just to spite them. But during those two weeks, as you can imagine, I'm, I've got uh, some pretty active folks on my team. Uh, so you can only test occasionally and, and in certain, er uh, certain times. Uh, so we went, uh, we went hunting, and we found this, um, uh, this boar hog that had little piglets who were about the right size to barbecue. You know the size? Uh, so we went down to the local, uh, local uh, uh, unit there and said, we need some more 45 rounds because we're going to get us a piglet. Uh, so we, uh, we went down and talked to the armorer down there and said, we need extra 45 rounds. And this guy says, what are you going to do with extra 45 rounds? Because obviously we're going to expend some, and they were all uh, accounted for. And we said, uh, told him what we were going to do. We, were gonna, uh, we weren't going to use the 45 rounds unless we had to. The mother, the mother pig uh, got us and, and got after us. We'd have to shoot her. And he said, well, okay, you can certainly do that if you want to. Uh, but you've got to understand that the uh, forest meister knows every pig in his area. He's probably named those piglets, and it is a 10,000 mark fine for every piglet that you kill. And he will know who did it within 24 hours because he checks them every day. Needless to say, we did not have pork that night. I will tell you, going to Grenada was my first opportunity to experience going into a combat zone, and I, not much about it, but uh, I will tell you, in the dark, walking down 
uh, at Green Ramp to get on the aircraft, and you're going past these huge bins, probably four feet square and five and four feet high, uh, with just ammo, extra magazines, grenades, water bottles, canteens, everything that you want, and just take it. I mean, as much as you wanted, as much as you wanted to carry, uh, it was there on Green Ramp, and you just walked past it and picked it up. It wasn't issued. Uh, they wanted you to take everything that you wanted to take with you uh, down to Grenada. Um, but in Grenada, it was actually pretty interesting. We lined up a uh, naval, and now remember, this is before Goldwater Nichols, okay? So jointness wasn't really a big thing. So we lined up a uh, destroyer one day to provide five-inch naval gunfire uh, for an attack. And if you're familiar with naval gunfire, you know, you've got mortars that go up really high, and then you've got howitzers that are next. Well, naval gunfire is flat and fast. I mean, those rounds get there in a hurry, and they are accurate. I don't know how the Navy does it, but they are accurate. Well, we lined this destroyer up to support this attack, and uh, the attack goes off. One round comes in, and it's not bad, and the destroyer takes off. And we're like, wait a minute, where are you going? It looked pretty good. And the destroyer radios back and says, ah, we don't like the gun target line, so we're out of here. Okay, well, Grenada is one of the reasons that we have Goldwater Nichols, because there was no joint commander on this joint operation in Grenada. Uh, you may remember the story about the, guy, the kid from the 82nd Airborne that was making phone calls back to Fort Bragg uh, to get uh, a fire control uh, uh, change called in to the, uh, to the, to, to the Army guns. Um, and then there was my friend Glenn Vavra. Glenn Vavra. Uh, I saw him jump into uh, Grafenvir one day, and I swear the men hit five times. The wind was blowing, and he came in running with the wind, and I swear he hit five times before he finally came to a stop. But Glenn's claim to fame was not that. He went to Halo School. He came out at 13.5 in one of his training jumps, 13,500 feet. And uh, he got to, he, he, it, before he even went flat, uh, he noticed that his rig was, uh, was malfunctioned up here on one of his quick releases. So he gets to working with it. And folks, there is, there is something that's called uh, narcosis of the deep. Well, you get the same thing at high altitude when you're jumping because you lose track of time. It's like you just go blank. So he's working on his uh, parachute trying to, trying to fix it, and he knows he's in trouble when the horizon flashes past his eyes. And he hits, and uh, the next thing he remembers is he's, uh, he's drowning in his own blood. And then he says, well, wait a minute, that's not blood, that's water. And uh, he realizes that he hit on the edge of the drop zone where there was a swamp. And he hit, literally hit on the edge of the drop zone and carved his way down to the depth of this pond, this swamp. And he got out of there. He had a small puncture wound on, behind one of his elbows, and he had one slightly compressed disc, and he was back jumping again within about two weeks from 13.5, and we used to just talk about that, that uh, the Lord had him in the palm of his hand. When I was in the 82nd, uh, the second time, I'd be, I was the G3 Air. Now, let me tell you, being the G3 Air of the 82nd Airborne Division was probably the best job I ever had because I controlled the jump aircraft and I controlled the parachutes. And if you want to be popular with a battalion commander in the 82nd Airborne Division, you own the parachutes because he always wants more parachutes. So I got any jump I wanted to. First thing Tracy will tell you in this, this era is I lost jump pay while I was the G3 Air of the 82nd Airborne Division because I forgot to jump one month. She laughs at it because we lost $110 that month. But I also had the most interesting jump that I ever had uh, was in a Connex under one of the flying cranes. You know, it looks like a praying mantis. So they attach a Connex to it, and you get up there, and this flying crane takes you up there, and you jump out of it. Well, the G3 Air, they wanted to put me in the door to be the first one out. And I said, no, I can't do that as a G3 Air. I'll go last. 
So I'm back there and I'm looking out portholes. This Conex had portholes in it because that's what you did with this thing. And so I'm looking out there and being an experienced jump master, I could tell that we were past the jump point, the release point, and uh, the green light hadn't come on. And so I'm relaxed back there and thinking, well, we're gonna go around, take another pass. And about that time, the green light comes on and people start exiting. It was one of the few times in the Army that I had a ethical decision to make. Technically, I should not have jumped because I had the experience and the training to know that you should not jump once you've passed a certain point. On the other hand, I was the G3 Air of the 82nd Airborne Division. If I'm in the last and I don't jump, what are those troopers going to think if I don't jump? So I jump out, and I could tell that I was probably not going to make the drop zone. So I start pulling my risers down as far as I can, standing on them, trying to get back to the drop zone. And I landed right in the corner of the, right in the, corner of the drop zone just before I would have hit in the tall trees. Uh, probably the most interesting jump that I've ever had. Um, Tracy and I were stationed in the U.S. Embassy in Cairo, Egypt. That was an interesting assignment. It was my first assignment in the, in the joint world. Uh, we were there for the foreign military sales. Um, um, I got to, in El Dorado Canyon, which was the attack against Gaddafi, had, had just happened just before we got there. Um, I, got to, uh, I got to listen to the, um, to the cockpit recording when they came to brief the ambassador uh, of the 111, the F-111. Uh, what a cacophony, cacophony of noise. I mean, I don't know how they sort it out. They've got warning bells. They've got people talking to them. They've got machines talking to them. Uh, but it was, uh, it was fascinating to, uh, to listen uh, to that. And we would go snorkeling in the Red Sea, very clear Red Sea. But you drive through the Sinai Desert, and you would see old tanks still in formation. I mean, they looked like they were, could be in movement formation, but they were dead. They'd been there, they obviously had been there for years. And I asked about them, and they said, uh, those are the uh, uh, Egyptian tanks that the Israelis destroyed uh, in the 73 war. They destroyed them so fast, they were still in, in uh, movement formation. Uh, fascinating, kind of a little time capsule of the, the 73 war. Um, we went to UCOM. Uh, I had, we were in UCOM, that's in Stuttgart, Germany, for three years. The first year I stood strategic nuclear watch. Uh, so I knew all of the elements, uh, all the cities that we would destroy people, how many we would destroy in each city should we go to strategic nuclear uh, war. Um, it was shift work, I didn't like it, uh, but, uh, but it was fascinating for me to know the elements of the single integrated operations plan. And then I worked with the Israelis the last two years, so I've been all over Israel. It was fascinating to learn the Israelis. Uh, they're an interesting uh, nation and interesting people. They're now uh, building multiple layers of missiles to protect themselves from the missiles that would come in. Uh, the Pentagon. Uh, I walked to work at the Pentagon. We lived in Pentagon City, literally across the highway from the Pentagon. So, uh, so I walked to work, and the, the blizzard of 96, the Pentagon shut down, basically. It's one of the few times that the Pentagon has ever shut down. Uh, but they did have to have essential people there, so I had to walk to work in the blizzard of 96 and, and man the office. Um, I was in black programs. Uh, so our conversation at night uh, was, uh, was twofold. There were two questions. Did you get to work out today? And did you get to go across the river? And across the river was to the White House complex, to the old executive office building, the o uh, OEOB, uh, to work with the national security uh, staff. Uh, occasionally went to the White House Situation Room. There I learned my poker face because you think knife fights happen on the street. You ought to go to the White House Situation Room and watch the deputies uh, go after each other. We went to, uh, we went to Belgium for the NATO military headquarters uh, assignment. Um, it was fascinating. I got to, uh, uh, I spent some time in, in uh, Bosnia and Kosovo, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, patrolling with the, both the US and the British uh, uh, patrols there. 
because I was building the forces, so I needed to go on the ground with the uh, people who were actually doing the job. Very interesting that the Brits and the, and the Americans had a totally different perspective on how they would patrol. Uh, the Americans would take their armored vehicle down into the center of town. They'd be wearing all their battle rattle and, and vests, and, and uh, they would look like an invading force. They got the job done, but the Brits took the opposite approach. They would put their armored vehicle on the nearest uh, ridge line in overwatch position. They'd wear their regular BDUs and their berets down into the town, and they were just as effective. Uh, but that was uh, their, national, uh, their national way of doing things. While I was there, the new uh, Deputy Supreme Allied Commander, who was at the time a British four-star, took me on his, uh, his introduction tour around all the nations. Most interesting interview that he had was with a man called Itzabegovic. Itzabegovic was the leader of the Bosn Bosniak Muslims. And I sat across from that man and listened to, to the to the general talk to him uh, through an interpreter, of course, most of it. He spoke a little bit of English. And I looked across at him and I said, I am sitting in the presence of evil because of the things that he had ordered, the things that he had done. On the other hand, I also stood on the side of an old rock quarry filled with water. Who knows how deep it was? And the conveyor, the conveyor belt was still there that they had used to convey the bodies that they had dug up and conveyed out into the middle of this flooded rock quarry so that they could destroy the evidence of war crimes. Bosnia was not a, uh, a good place to, to live at, at, during those days. But then years later, Tracy and I were driving through just probably four or five years ago. We, were, we took a river trip in Eastern Europe and we were on a bus trip through Belgrade. Uh, and I, there was a building there that we passed, maybe a 10-story building, and I looked up at it, and there was obviously bomb damage on the side of the building. Everything around, there's no sign of war or anything, but there's obvious bomb damage to this building, and this was only like four or five years ago. And I said, That's, that looks strange. Why is there bomb damage to that building? I looked down and saw the sign. It was the MOD. And I said, oh my gosh, that's the building that we tomahawked. Uh, we put a tomahawk missile in in 1999. Um, they've left the bomb damage there just for people to see. And later I met, um, I met uh, Albanian Serbian, uh, Albanian who know the Serbs. And I said, what, what is that all about? And uh, he said, it's a cultural thing. We would never understand it as Americans, but he said culturally they leave it up there to remind themselves that they were victims of that uh, tomahawk attack. Um, strange to me, but uh, there it was. Uh, that building still had, uh, uh, had bomb damage in it. And I want to close uh, the stories with the uh, story of my heaviest jump ever. It was my nuclear-capable um, SF team, Special Forces team. Uh, it was a night jump off of a C-130 ramp. So for those of you that uh, the plane is flying that way, I'm looking out the back of the plane off the ramp. That we're, It's a ramp jump, not a door jump. I had a 91-pound rucksack hanging in front of me. I had 21 pounds, uh, 20 pounds of web gear hanging on me. My rifle was in a case on my left side. Uh, obviously, my parachute was on my back. My, my reserve parachute was in front of me. Um, I was too heavily loaded to look around to see where we were going, so I kept checking with the Air Force uh, loadmaster, the Air Force guy, and he said, no, we're doing fine. So in my mind's eye, I could picture where we were going, and I knew that we would pop out of the mountains and we'd be on the flat DZ. Now, we, we jump in SF, you jump on very small DZs. You're taking at that time, we had 13 men coming out of that aircraft. So we got everybody hooked up. We're waiting on the green light, and I'm, I'm uh, trying to determine if, if we were going to go because it looked like we were pretty low. And uh, the green light came on, but before it did, I looked back at my team just to see if everybody was ready. And in my mind's eye, I can still see this. There were 12 sets of eyes looking at me as intently as possible it is possible. And I, uh, without a shadow of a doubt, 
If I made the decision to go off of that ramp, because on a ramp jump, the jump master goes first. If I made a decision to go off of that ramp, not knowing where we were, because I couldn't see, they were gonna go with me. Uh, so when the green light came on, I stepped off, I came out, I came out face down, and the trees were right there. It takes 200 feet to open your parachute. I'm betting we jumped at 250, 275 feet because it opened, I swung, I was in the trees. Uh, we didn't hurt anybody badly that night. The bomb, and I had time to see the bomb. The bomb came out second. Beaver McCann jumped the bomb. Uh, it came out second, and so everybody was okay. We did a medevac one man, but it was a slight medevac. Um, so I'm in a tree. I'm in one of those trees that I was seeing. So I did the dumbest thing I did in the Army at that point. You're supposed to take off your helmet and drop your helmet and see how high you are, because it's pitch black. It's a German forest. It's kind of, it's kind of near the Black Forest. And I, so I, I don't take off my helmet. I pull my quick releases so this 91-pound rucksack goes 15 feet on the lowering line and starts bouncing. And I realized that thing could have dragged me out of this tree. So I know I'm at least 15 feet high. So then I do take off my helmet. And I drop my helmet. And it goes crash, crash, bang, bang, boom, crash, 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 bunk. And I say, how high is it? What kind of tree is this? I didn't know they had sequoias in Germany. <laughs> uh, so I find a trunk real fast because I don't want to be falling like that helmet did. Well, I took my rifle with me, of course, left everything else up there. Rucksack was already down there, took my rifle with me, and it was a long way down. Um, so th they actually couldn't find my parachute uh, after the, after the uh, exercise was over. So Tracy, it was a 30-day exercise. Of course, the parachute was in the tree for 30 days. Uh, so 30 days later, Tracy and I went back, and I found it, and we got it out of the tree. But... Uh, uh, and I used to have, and I may still have something I cut out of it, the panel I cut out of it, because I wanted to save that panel because that parachute was never going to be jumped again after uh, staying out there for a month. So I want to close with my analysis of the Army since 1975. The Army that we built from 1975 to 1991 that army that we talked about that uh, won tank battles in seven seconds. It did not exist when we went to Iraqi freedom in 2002. The numbers were just not there. Now, the technology was. The technology has, had increased, but the army as a size, as a capability, was not there. We didn't need it, thank goodness. And frankly, that army does not exist today. Technology continues to advance, but frankly, our army, our military, all of our services uh, need some rebuild and refit like we saw in 1973. Uh, there's nothing new under the sun. Um, we cannot plan to fight the last war. I will tell you, we're probably in World War III now with the fentanyl, that, fentanyl that's coming across the border uh, intentionally. Uh, the next war will be cyber warfare, beyond the horizon missiles of every ilk, space warfare, and constant movement by grand, uh, ground forces, constant movement by ground forces against instantaneous targeting and firing. My era is gone. The equipment that I used in the 70s, 80s, 90s uh, is antiquated compared to the equipment of today. I would have loved to have had personal secure comms, radio on my head, uh, silenced weapons. I would, have, I would have killed for silenced, weapon, silenced weapons. Um, and personal night vision. Night vision today is ubiquitous. We had one or two that we could use, but they were uh, second generation. Now we're at the sixth generation, I think, of night vision, and it's very ubiquitous. Um, so those are some of my experiences uh, while I was in the Army. Um, I want to stop there and just thank you for listening to me, reminiscing with me as I... Tracy tells me that uh, she learned something during this campaign about my Army career because she doesn't know everything I did. 
Uh, when I was in the Pentagon, I had a mission to go to Europe. Um, that happened very quickly. I went to Europe. I could have flown back the same day, uh, but I couldn't because of simply the flight, uh, the flight times. Uh, so Tracy tells me that she learns uh, something almost every time I speak on my military experiences. Uh, but it was a great career, I think, for those in the audience. Uh, there were times that were really good, and there were a few times that were really bad. Uh, but it was a wonderful career for me. It was a wonderful time uh, that I will uh, always cherish. Tracy and I talk all the time that we talk about my military career more than we do any other time in our married life. So thank you for listening to me. I appreciate it. And... Uh, Hope these experiences have been entertaining to you because that's the way it was meant. Thank you so much. And now, uh, representing VFW 2195, the, honor, the past commander, Dave Cornett, Artie Foster, and Colin Kimball. They have a presentation for you, Congressman-elect. Judge, former Judge Self, is the third leg of the Fallen Warrior Portrait Project. When R.D. and I had the idea of coming up with this project, uh, he was the one who made it happen. And so I uh, always think of him as uh, one of the team. But we wanted to give you something to take to Washington so that when you uh, have one of these moments that you need to contemplate a tough decision, uh, you can look at somebody that we know you admire. So. Uh, we did a portrait. Of George C. Marshall as a young lieutenant colonel. Did it for two reasons to remind you of your similar path. But as a young lieutenant colonel in the First World War. Um, he established himself as somebody who would speak truth to power. He was a on the staff of the 1st Division when they were preparing for the Meuse-Argonne Offensive, and General Pershing, who was the overall commander, came to do an inspection and was very upset with the things that he saw, the lack of preparation, and he started uh, chewing out the, the general who was in charge of the 1st Division. But young Lieutenant Colonel Marshall stepped forward and reminded the general, Pershing, that many of the shortcomings that the general wouldn't speak about were due to shortcomings from Pershing staff. And people thought that, well, that was going to be the end of his career, but it endeared him, endeared him to uh, General Pershing, and he would later serve on his staff. And so it's a reminder of uh, the courage it takes to speak the truth to power, and, and so we portrayed him here as a uh, young lieutenant colonel. I will just add one thing. How many of you have read George C. Marshall's autobiography? There is none. George C. Marshall said, I know too much, and I refuse to put it in writing. A man of character. Thank you so much, Colin R.D. Any questions from the audience? And uh, don't be bashful, because on Monday he goes to Washington, and you won't have a lot of chance to talk to him. <laughs> questions, comments, protest. Questions? 
Anybody have a question? Oh. Okay. Here we go. Congressman, when is the last time that you jumped out of an airplane? Last time. Last time I jumped out of an airplane was in 2008 uh, with the Golden Knights uh, over in Fort Worth. Wow, thank you for your service. Thank you for supporting us. Thank you. Questions, comments, protest? Back here in the back. For, forgive my lack of military knowledge, but you mentioned the Halo team several times. Could you talk about that a little? Yeah, Halo is a uh, high altitude, low opening. Uh, these are uh, the teams that come out that, uh, well, it can go up uh, higher than that, but uh, a normal normal altitude jump is 13.5 uh, going on up to, you have to get oxygen and, and uh, uh, gear that, that takes you to the higher altitudes, but they can go up uh, pretty high. But a normal jump is 13.5. So they come out at 13.5, we'll call it 25,000. Um, and uh, then they free fall uh, for several minutes uh, depending on how high they are, and then you open your chute at uh, whatever you want to. Uh, 2,000 would be normal. Back here in the back? And it could go far lower. Hello. Um, I don't have much knowledge about uh, uh, the topic, but then I heard this, that AOC and Ilhan, you know, those guys, would like to reduce the funding or also, for that matter, just cut the retirement fundings specifically for the veterans and the guys in the defense. And uh, we, we would love for, I mean, we would really want to fight um, any such kind of ideologies because you would really want to protect the people who protect all of us. The question is uh, cutting the retirement. That was one of the discussions which, which was going on, which I heard, which they were promoting. And uh, um, we definitely would want to fight that out. and protect the people who protect us? Uh, yeah, I will just uh, tell you that I think how we treat our veterans, and we treat them well today, how we treat our veterans uh, will determine, will go a long way to determining how our young people view military service. Uh, our Vietnam veterans came back to a uh, culture that uh, spit on them. My brother, who's sitting back there, was a couple of years ahead of me at West Point, and not during my time, but during his time, he remembers uh, when there were uh, the girls from uh, one of the colleges up there uh, demonstrating at the gates of West Point. So that was, uh, that was the era that uh, some of these Vietnam veterans came back to. Uh, we hear stories of people that would wear, obviously came back uh, from overseas in their uniform. They would change out of their uniform before they left the airport so that they wouldn't be uh, abused. Yes, Bob. Keith, what is your assessment of the armed forces today? I think they are, first of all, let's talk about the wokeness. Uh, first of all, they're in trouble with recruiting. And uh, only 25% of our young people today are even qualified to join the military for obvious reasons, uh, legal problems, obesity, diabetes, uh, um, just can't, uh, they've got issues with the law, normally education, um, but they are not authorized to join the military. So only 25% can even sign up. Then you go into the wokeness today in the military, and uh, those 25% are probably the young people who want the mission, who want the camaraderie, who want the challenge who want the, the experience of a military that is going to challenge them, that's going to train them, that's going to push them, 
And that's not the military today. So why would the 25% that are authorized to join the military, if they are those sorts of folks, why would they join the military? Uh, so I think the military's got recruiting problems. I know the military has policy problems overseas because uh, they see the American, uh, they see uh, uh, America as weak today for many reasons, but primarily uh, just over, well, almost uh, 15 months ago when we uh, withdrew from uh, Afghanistan uh, overnight without telling our, our uh, allies. Uh, Bagram uh, was given up. Bagram was where I was, and it was my home station in Afghanistan. Uh, it was literally a fortress. I mean, we could have defended Bagram. So they turned Bagram over overnight, and they tried to pull everybody out of Afghanistan through the international airport in Kabul. It wasn't going to work. It was a, it's an international airport. It's not a military base, and it uh, wasn't going to work. So the, the, the entire withdrawal, immediately we started to see our enemies around the world start testing us. Uh, so I think we've got that issue as well. So we've got recruiting issues. Uh, funding is something that I won't automatically say they're underfunded, but I will say some of their funding goes to things that I think we need to uh, re-examine. Questions, you, comments? You throw in the jab. We're, we're losing a lot because they don't want to get jabbed. And people want to come in necessarily want, don't want the jab as well. So I, I think you're right. I think there's some uh, troubled rows ahead. And frankly, we're going to be tested in the, in the near future by, because um, our young Americans will go in harm's way. I don't know when, I don't know where, but uh, we will send young Americans in harm's way again at some point. Any questions, comments, protest? Lady in the front. Thank you. Okay. I totally agree with everything you say about our military. Do you think there is any chance that we could be invaded because we're so weak? No. Good. I think that was the shortest answer you've ever given. <laughs> question, one last question, and then it's picture time. You have a question, sir? Let me bring it up to you. This gives me exercise. While I'm walking up there, tell them one more thing you know about General Marshall we don't know. General Marshall accompanied President Roosevelt to think Tehran, one of the, uh, the get-togethers with uh, Stalin and uh, Churchill. Um, his, fun, his son was fighting in Africa, uh, not Africa, Italy at the time. He was on the spine of Italy at the time with an infantry unit. Uh, General Marshall had planned to stop by and visit him on his way home. That was the uh, conference uh, that Roosevelt told him that he would not command the overlord invasion on D-Day. Um, George Marshall thought that he would get the job, but uh, Roosevelt thought he was just too important to give him that job. He was known as the architect of victory. Uh, he was the man that had made the tough decisions to keep the landing craft away from uh, the Pacific, uh, instead stockpiled them for the Atlantic invasion uh, across the channel. Uh, and he went up against MacArthur uh, uh, to make that decision. So he went around the world. Uh, it's, it's probably the one time that he allowed himself the emotion to take some time to go around, come home around the world the other way. Uh, because he did not make that trip, he didn't get to see his son who was killed uh, shortly thereafter. Um, Keith, yeah, most senators and representatives, when they first go to Washington, they're very, you know, making an effort to do what's right. What are you going to do? And then by the year, second or third year up there, they're just like a Washington insider, not doing what they should be doing, but doing what they want to do. What are you going to do to make sure that you don't fall in that same trap? 
um, find in the army you learn real fast uh, you don't go to a fight uh, without taking as many friends with you as you can uh, I, I want an accountability group which means my wife is going to travel with me which means we're going to have uh, we're going to find other Christians uh, to uh, to socialize with uh, I'm also going to find uh, those representatives who uh, who believe as I do and uh, try to form alliances with them because this will be a wild two or three years folks wild we don't even know who's going to control Congress yet uh, I think we will have a narrow narrow majority in the house I have no idea what's going to be in the Senate so it's liable to be a wild two years I'm going to ask the last question or maybe a comment but my re when I read a, lot, a biography of General Eisenhower. One of the toughest decisions he ever made, he said he made many tough decisions, but one of them, General Marshall asked him to evaluate the possibility of saving Corregidor. And General Eisenhower studied it in length and had to make the painful decision that it was indefensible. Do you have any comments on that? He was right. There you go. <laughs> Thank you all.